okay, we're going to get into the terms for, instead of using God bless you, people are saying words like, may God bless you, or I hope God blesses you, or um, these kind of terms. So it's saying, well, it's kind of a loaded question where <laughs> you're kind of saying, well, I hope you'll choose God, right? Or if it's even talking to a believer, it's like, well, I'm not sure if you're converted, but I'm praying for you, brother. But if you're talking among the faithful, the converted people, it's just God bless you or Yahweh bless you if you prefer using sacred names. Okay. You're not going to say, well, I hope God will bless you. Because that's saying, well, you're kind of astray, you're kind of backsliding. It's kind of a way of not really blessing, not really just with the remnant, not together in Christ with the elect, which these are foregone conclusions. Excuse my voice, I did lose my voice over the weekend. It's a Thanksgiving time, <laughs> and I got a new puppy who... Uh, I had to catch a few times. He's a little Houdini trying to get away in the cold, so it made it a little worse under the weather. Under the weather, as they say. So uh, just bear with me. And so this whole teaching of yes, okay, there are meaning well people. They still want to bless someone, and so let's say you're talking to really. You know, they are backslidden people, and they are sort of lost, right? So, and they don't want to bid someone Godspeed. So, really, are really, uh, as you would say, like pure or holiness people, which we should be, they don't want to, as it says, you don't, do not bid Godspeed to them who do not have our doctrine you could end up giving Godspeed, which means you're a partaker of their evil deeds, and you will be part of the one who enabled that person to do the evil. So, there had become a practice not to fully say, God bless you, but kind of say, well, may God bless you. So, people will put that at the bottom of their email as they lecture someone. Well, I think that that's a good thing to do, is lecture. The Bible says, teach thoroughly all the commandments at all times. And it, it, that you're supposed to talk about it when you walk on the way. Talking about what? Talking about his commandments. Not about feelings and things like that, but actually commandments. And it says if it's not his word, then there's no light in them. No truth, no light. Okay. So I just want to encourage folks to really use the scriptures to bless each other. You could, for example, pull out, there's hundreds of blessings. Pull out one next time you talk to another believer in Christ and bless them. Tell them, for example, maybe go grab the Beatitudes. You know, blessed are they that mourn. If you know someone who's mourning, tell them that blessing. You know, tell them about it because it says, then they will be comforted with so that blessing. So tell them that God has has promised them to make it that they're going to make it and it's going to be all right you can pull out any one of the bible verses that's why it's called a sword of the spirit okay we're going to have the sword of the spirit which is going to slay the lies of the enemy it's going to come against the problems in the world which it says the flesh mind wars against the spirit mind and we got to choose. Are we going to choose flesh or are we going to choose spirit? And we're actually commanded, crucify the flesh and walk in the spirit. And his word is spirit and is life. So we gonna, we're going to just shine that light of his word. His word is, a, as Paul, or as, sorry, King David said, that his word is a light to our path. Uh, and that a, it is a lamp to our feet. So praise him and thank him and declare his wonderful good promises. And if you're not sure any, you can remind them 
that he said that they have certain blessings. There's unconditional blessings. There's a whole bunch of them. If you've been baptized, if you've been converted, if you have chosen Christ and you have, and you are not like wavering, say, oh, I'm not sure if I really chose him. Well, if you know you chose Christ, then you can declare these blessings of Abraham that have to do with obedience. Okay? And you can declare those ones. You can declare them to your brothers in Christ. Through Christ's blood, you are blessed with all the blessings of obedience, as it says. Now, what happens is the devil tricks people to live under the curse or pretend they have a curse and go live with those who have rejected Christ under their dominance and under their foot but actually it's supposed to be the snakes are under our feet if you're the one walking that says the snakes are gonna you're gonna trample them because what happens people who are snakes which could be anyone who's a non-believer in christ they're twofold the child of hell if they're an adamite and they got converted into these antichrist philosophies okay now, another thing it says is, judge not lest you be judged, right? So, let's say that someone didn't even, they've just been saying, may God bless you, because someone they really liked, a real good Christian brother or sister, was saying it, and they don't know why, but that's the way. They have adopted to say it, and they don't know why. Well, now you know the roots. It's because we don't want to bid God speed. And I'm sure a lot of people are meaning well, but you really should not bless anyone, and that's a good practice. It's a safe practice. If you just got people out there, but you want to tell them the gospel, though. Let's bless them. Let's get them blessed. So let's tell them Christ died for their sins, that we might live. And now there is a blessing that has to do with not judging, because it says, judge not lest you be judged. Well, guess what? If you're going to show mercy, he will be merciful unto you. That's a blessing, too. And there may even be a third way people are saying, may God bless you, and they have another intent altogether, or a fourth, or a fifth. Some know that we're all in Christ, and they may be talking to others who are in Christ, but it's kind of like saying, we're not all one. So, it's saying, come on and be with me, be one with us all, to get that blessing of that being blessed by being in him. Now, that's a whole other topic altogether, but it is important. And it all continues with this subject full circle. Declaring his word but let's celebrate his word unto others and let's tell them, let's, let's take this to the real gospel of the word. I don't know any scripture that says, may God bless you. So I think that's a pharisaical thing that has come out. It says, you are blessed and we're blessed based on Christ. Yes. And so if you're saying if you're in Christ, then you got the blessings. So sure. That may be a justification. In Galatians chapter 3, it tells us that by the blood of the Lamb, all the blessings of Abraham come upon us. And that includes the conditional blessings that have to do with obedience. And yes, if you're saying in faith, someone who's chosen Christ, you're going to deal with them also on the basis. It says, reckon the old man dead, but alive unto Christ. Okay, let's say, okay, we're going to expect that they're going to want to keep the commandments, right? But if you're talking to someone who really didn't receive Christ, who don't, doesn't want to keep the commandments, then it'll be a shock and a surprise. But let's not be shocked. Let's look to Christ. Let's realize, look, if they've received him, it says they've been converted, and therefore they're going to go all the way. We need to have faith. It says he had so much faith that he laid down his life and were to do the same. He knew we would choose him one day and went in faith. And therefore, we also, faith is actually the obedience. 
as it says, faith cometh by hearing, and that word hearing there is the word for obey. That word shema is used in the same quotation of that same Greek word when Christ was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord thy God is one. Okay, that's a very specific text. That's the Hebrew text that's used every morning and every evening, how you start your day. How I started this message as well. It says you talk about the commandments when you sit in your home, when you walk on the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You talk about them. And you make them as signs upon your eyes, on your doorposts of your house. You tie them. You should see it on your arm. It should see it should just be known that you love his commandments, that you've chosen to be with the righteous. That it's unmistakable that you're a believer. That it's known and that you are talking about his commandments, not your own. And sure, when you're going in faith that other people are going to also agree with you about loving his law, you see, at least you're going with the victory that's in Christ. And if you, if you run into folks who said they believed with you for a while, and then it turns out they didn't after a while. That's their loss. But you did your part. And it pans out. That means they never believed in the first place. They never were converted in the first place. If they say, oh yeah, I'll do, I'll, I'll do what God wants, but I won't do that. I won't do that one thing. Well, come on. Don't they know that his law is liberty? Don't they know that it says that only sin is bondage? And keeping his laws is freedom. It says throughout the scriptures that it is our flesh that deceives us and the heart is deceivable above all things. Saying, oh, you need to do that bad sin. 1 John 3, 4 tells us sin is transgression of the law. Anytime you want to keep the transgression of the law as your lifestyle, that is where it says, depart from me, I never knew you, you who work iniquity, or that word is there, practicing lawlessness in the original. That means their actual lifestyle has chosen not to respond and obey and love his commandments. As it says in the New Testament, would be his commandments, the little New Testament, like it says, is the commandments written on our heart, and his blood sealed it. Okay? You have the heart, you have the blood, you have the body. You love his commandments. Now, that's what it says. I'll make a new covenant with him. And I will write my commandments in their heart. Which is a big difference. Huge difference than it was before. Just written on stone tablets. Okay? Or other Stones, it says they writ, they wrote it on, including animal skins and whatever kind of parchment they had. They writ, they wrote it down in the scrolls. But now it's written on flesh tablets of the heart, and you are living epistles, read of men. Again, it should be known that we're a believer that we have chosen him it should be reflecting so that between our eyes it says it's known we are just busy with his commandments so okay maybe you don't see a way that we could do that right away but it should be a lot of the day where if you look you're holding the bible you're reading it so there is that sign between your eyes it says his commandments should be all around us and so, there you go. We expect and we should praise that others are praising and thanking and have already chosen him, as it says, reckon the old man dead, but alive unto Christ. Every man alive unto Christ. So, we not only look at our own flesh as dead and buried, okay, the flesh is gone, crucified, and was defeated at the cross, and that we are now alive unto him, and that we are in the new creature, the new man, resurrected, sonship, that the only other human being who ever got the title of sonship besides Christ was Adam. No one else 
it says, was a son of God. Sure, they had many children, but they didn't have sonship. But now it says we can become sons. Huge difference. B'nai Elohim. It is like a higher being. If you read that the B'nai Elohim came down from heaven, okay? It is a higher state of being that comes through birth, not through conversion and through uh, all of the things that have to do with study. No, it's a creation. You are a new creature, it says in him. And you are able by that indwelling spirit man who now can resurrect, it says, the power that resurrected Christ will quicken your mortal vitals in the now. In, your, in the now, your body will be quickened. It doesn't talk about that happening at the resurrection, although that is included. There are so many verses about it in the present tense. The chapter there. Now, I might run through a few verses, but I encourage you to use a a quick search tool to go now to your Bible and look up those verses, each and every one, and study them. Okay? The verses before them, the verses after them, and really see the context, really see and study. You can use Blue Letter Bible, search the the phrases, because I quote perfect King James here. That's one thing you can always expect, is I'm going to quote you the word perfectly, okay? Now, I might not always have handy the actual reference where it is, and it is not my full-time job. I'm like Paul, who was a tent maker. Paul didn't write in his writings, oh, pause here and put a reference number there. He was writing to the Corinthians, and yeah, he did say search the scriptures, but he never said, oh, and here's a quote from... uh, Numbers, chapter, number, you know, and give it like that. He never did that. It becomes a hindrance to the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ if we have to stop and go down to the letter. It says the letter killeth, although the letter is living in us. The word of God. And it's taught. It's the foolishness of preaching that teaches the most. Okay? It says, we don't preach the intellectualism like of the Greeks and so forth and the philosophy and all of that. It says, we are teaching Christ crucified. And that is the foolishness of the gospel. And that is what, you know, it sounds foolish to the flesh mind. That's what it always said, right? That the law of God is foolishness to the mind of the flesh. They can't understand it. It says his law is spirit. Romans 7, 14. I like to, you know, use verses as much as I can so you can really see, wow, you know, especially for all of our great Bible believer friends that they can also confide and go, wow, that's one I need to memorize. Let's get that one in our heart. And in Romans 7, 14, it tells us that the mind of the flesh wars against the mind of the spirit. You know, it says we are transformed by the renewing of our minds, okay? We are a new creature, right? But sometimes you don't realize, it says you're going to be metamorphosized, okay? What you are is being transformed, okay? By the renewing of our mind in the image of him that created him. You're going to be renewed in the knowledge of the image, it says. And you're going to be transformed, it says. And his praise shall continually be in our mouth. Let's speak of the victory in him. We who are resurrected in him. We who are walking in the spirit. We who have chosen him, not sin. We who have put behind the works of the devil in the flesh. We who love and enjoy and celebrate, as David and Solomon says, we delight greatly in his commandments and meditate in them day and night. Hallelujah. That's what we all believe in. And we celebrate it. We got to be singing the right song. 
When we get to heaven, and we're going to be talking about 900 more generations, his law has been commanded until heaven and earth, even after, it says, even after heaven and earth passes away, still not one jot or one tittle will pass from the law. No, not until all the prophets get fulfilled and all the laws, which are national laws. 74% of all the commandments in the Bible cannot be fulfilled by a man. It's only fulfilled when a nation does certain things. And there are commandments in there that are only national law applicable for a whole nation to do. It could never be done on in one man. It says that, it, that King David tried to wipe out the Canaanites, but it was a commandment that was for the whole nation to do. And they were not cooperating. He only got rid of about one-third a little less than one third of the Canaanites and the Edomites later continued to be a scourge upon God's people. And there are people in, of other tribes holding back the covenant people. It says there's two kinds of seed that are growing in the earth. There's the wheat and there's the tares. The tares, it says, is, that's like weeds that really damage the wheat and in oppress the wheat from growing to its fullest capability. Weeds in your garden you don't want. They take the nutrients from the rest of the crop. So the, the tares, it says, will grow side by side, it says in the scriptures, and that you are to let them grow together until they come to maturity, because if you rip them out too early, not at the harvest, you're going to end up damaging the wheat if you rip them out and lose entire structures of wheat rather than just them being a little weakened and growing a tiny bit smaller than the rest. So that's what we want. We wait, it says. But you got to know, but it says the tares will go together with the wheat. That's the point I wanted to mention. They grow together with the wheat. And if you look through history, it says that he will sift his people like like grains of wheat through the earth and not one kernel will fall to the ground but all of them will go to his purpose okay he's gonna use his seed and he doesn't lose any of them and he sifts us like wheat and it says that the good seed is the seed of the kingdom of his people there's many parables again it reiterates it and it says that the tares, the wicked ones, sowed those into our field. But in any case, it says wherever our people are, you're going to have them, the bad apples, or shall we say the tares themselves, growing up side by side. And we are to know that that happens throughout time. But it says at the end of time, he will come and will First, send the angels to first gather the tares and burn them before any rapture happens. Okay? Now, some want to argue, well, there's different kinds of rapture. Some like to say there's the pre-trib, the post-trib, and the mid-trib, and all of this. And even in the scriptures, it's been justified to show there's seven resurrections in the Bible. Some want to talk about two resurrections, the the main resurrection, and then after the thousand-year reign of Christ, there's another resurrection. Sure, some people want to talk about all that as being either like a rapture or whatnot, but it says we will have his laws, the constitution of the land, for a thousand years, and they're going to be celebrating it for sure. There's going to be a lot less sin. It says it's going to be much easier when Christ is here with us, but for now we mourn because he is away. And we await for him. And that's why we have many fastings. Christ foretold that they would be fasting when he is gone. And now, if we're not seeing the fasting, if we're not seeing the troubles, he says that as they persecuted me, they will persecute you. So if you're not being persecuted as well, then you got to check what you're doing. And check, because the one of the marks and the signs to know that you're with him would be, are you being persecuted? Do you have something 
in your life, socially, wherever. Something that has impacted you and has maybe hurt you. That's a persecution, okay? And you've had to adapt your life and live in a certain way. That's a persecution. When you've been slandered, when you've been maligned, he said, when they speak all manner of evil against you falsely, that's what it says, for righteousness sake, okay? It says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you, for great is your reward in heaven. So we are to press on. There's what's called the, you have the two resurrections. We all know that. But you have the first resurrection, which is of the first fruits. That's those who overcame. It says, the, they're not everybody's going to be an overcomer. Okay. But it says, to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me on my father's throne. Now, not everybody's going to be sitting on his father's throne, are they? It says there's 12 apostles who are on the 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel, those are also special thrones. And if you read the Bible, it says one of his first creations were thrones. Okay, he predestinated, elected, and called his people to be what they are. From the foundations of the earth, he elected, ordained, consecrated, and sent those of us to our positions and we go forward as he had planned and ordained. That goes not only for the righteous, but also for the wicked. It says that he has missed with much long suffering, endured the wicked, that he might bring his sons to glory. That we, when we overcome, that when we persevere, that when we fall aside and get whipped by these when the snake comes up to bite and we finally rise up to be the eagle saints that we should be to fly above and smash those serpents, crush them, to see them from way far away. And that's what we're to be in him, which is we are to be like eagles and we are to be like lions, okay? And we are to be as the humble servant, the ox, and we are to be a righteous man or woman of righteous humanity in the right emotions and feelings as well. So there are always these polar opposites in him. Okay, If people don't understand you, it's because you're a balanced person, not because you're unbalanced. Sure. Some some folks who are balanced too, they can see that you're balanced. But some who are only specialized in one area, they may not notice other people being balanced in other areas. And that's fine. They haven't tested you. But the main point is judge not lest you be judged. Sure, there's a lot of folks who are so balanced. And that's what people don't understand. For example, how can you be sometimes saying something strongly and also sometimes saying something gently. Well, because each situation is different and calls for a proper response in measure, as is appropriate. Right? So, that's for an example how someone may not, and they will even try to slander someone. So if 99% of the time you're the gentle person and the 1%, you correctly see Christ was also very gentle, but then he also got also very wrathful. He also was very good at seeing what was going on and discerning things, as well as showing the right emotions and being so friendly. But in some cases, he would look very unfriendly. Okay, because the appropriateness to the circumstance. Now, people could, could just twist the, the few unfriendly things he did, which were the only correct thing to do, 
and then say, well, that's what he is. That's all he does. Could they not? There was a time Christ went into the temple with a cat of nine tails and threw over the tables. But it doesn't say he did that all the time. But, you know, some could have just grabbed that. It says he went to the temple all the time, as was his custom. Okay? He went to the synagogue every Sabbath. It says that the saints of the, uh, in the book of Acts, they were in the temple continually every morning and then breaking bread from house to house. Okay, there was the common fellowship bread that came out of the temple of the daily meal offerings. Okay, and they lived off of that bread. They survived and they were able to spread the gospel, it says, and to continue in the service and in the prayers. That's why they had to hire Stephen in the, to do the distributions with all the donations that came in. And it says the great company of those temple saints in the first century were converted to the gospel. This is why the Romans went and tried to kill so many of them. There were several different times. One was with Nero. But the scriptures tell us the church just really grew and, and spread and was very strong. Paul's even said to set aside extra tithes to pick them up to send them to Jerusalem. Did he not? He did. Because that's where the scriptures say everything and including where Christ will come back to. And he said, remove not the ancient landmark. And he has ordained it. He's going to put his feet down on the Mount of Olives right there in the Holy Land and will use that land and the heavenly Jerusalem will come down in the new heavens and new earth. And yes, he's going to, even some environmentalists may not like to hear this, but it says he's going to come and damage the earth. He himself, not a nuclear bomb. Well, there's going to be something, a great stone that hits the earth. And it's going to make a, some have estimated, I think, a one quarter to one third of the earth will be totally destroyed. It says all green grass, including all cereals and wheat grain, all the stuff that we eat, will be burned up off the face of the earth. And it says nearly all the trees as well get burned up. So, you know, we're going to have a, quite a time where he's going to hit the earth besides that. And it's, he's, he's going to not only shake the earth, but he's going to shake the heavens as well. And what's going to come down out of there, he's going to cast down. It's going to, that's where you're going to see those beasts come out that look like packs of locusts. The fallen angels who were brought into that great pit and are sealed. And not only them, but in Tartarus, all kinds of beasts that they only saw in the pre-flood and some in the Greek mythologies very well laid out that are buried and are in chains. And it also talks about the angels that sin. It's in the book of Jude and other places in the Bible who reserved unto the great judgment of the great day. And it says the people will all go down to the, the caves and the bellies of the earth to, to, to escape the wrath of the Lamb of Jesus Christ who is coming back to punish. And it says he will damage the earth. He will uproot. And everything that he has not planted will be uprooted, it says. Okay. And before that, it says every man's going to run to his own heritage. They're going to flee to their own homeland, it says. Something's going to happen. And... It says, everyone that is found will be thrust through. Wherever they're found, they're going to be thrust through. It doesn't say how, what, and where, and all that. It just says, however and wherever. If you're found, you are thrust through. That means cut through with a sword. Okay? And if that could be a spear, perhaps. Perhaps it could be a spear. Could that be a gun? Okay, then if it could be a spear, it could easily be a gun. 
But there are darts in the Bible mentioned. There are arrows. Okay, but thrusting is typically a sword being thrust through. You can do a word study on that. Sure, go on Blue Letter Bible and Google that one, being thrust through. Everyone that has found, just, you'll find the verse in one second flat. You can click on the Greek word right there, and you can look up what was translated from there. Is it truly a thrusting with, a, with an arm? You know, and it says they're all going to be slain, and everyone will flee to their own homeland and heritage. They're not going to stick around where they don't have a true claim. They're going to stand where their ancestors and where their people have been consecrated. Okay? Where they have declared and where they have in their lot of their tribe been who they are. True occupiers of that place. For example, Israel, true Israel, was supposed to wipe out all the Canaanites. Those Canaanites were living there before the Israelites came. Still, that's the heritage, okay, that belongs only to Israel. And all those Canaanite tribes, which are descendant of the way down there of the giants and Nephilim and all that, okay, that weren't meant to be there. So, praise God, you know, it will happen. Whether we sit on our hands, whatever we do, go to sleep, go, to, go ahead and die, whatever. Still, it's going to happen. Nothing we can do about it. But we can celebrate each other. And we can do as he's commanded us to do. That's the true light in us. That is his word. So we're going to celebrate that people are blessed. And so... We can declare his word. Blessed are the peacemakers. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You can go through the Beatitudes. It's a wonderful one. Declare those to someone today. Find a few verses and go ahead and share it. All right? His word. And his word being fulfilled via Christ and you and him. And now... You're going to at least be seeking first his kingdom, right? It doesn't mean you're going to have his kingdom perfectly. But it says, as you seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, then all these things shall be added unto you. So, that means all the necessities of life come once you have chosen to put him first and his laws first, okay? Remember I was saying that his laws are all national well, every kingdom has laws, right? Well, the kingdom of God is all operating on laws. That means you're going to want to do it and celebrate it and everything else. So, uh, I just encourage you to pray. Seek his face. Ask forgiveness of any and all sin. Truly mean it with all your heart. And go ahead. Take some verses. Take Romans 4.7. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sin is covered. So, as you have confessed your sins, he is faithful and just to wash and cleanse you of all sin and unrighteousness. So, I hope you enjoy this one. And I look forward to making a next one for you. And we'll keep this a bit short because of the throat. But uh, do keep us in your prayers. We want to see the ministry and more guests come on the podcast and make a, a great one for all the believers to be encouraged to go forward in strength. Take care and may God bless. Bye-bye.